Let's talk about gin and specifically how Knott's Flask from Critical Role has revolutionized this character for me in terms of competitive play. Now, before I jump into Knott's Flask and why this card is so, so key to unlocking Jin, let's first just talk about Jin himself, uh, what he does and what he really wants to see from his deck, where his weaknesses are and where his strengths are. Jin is a six-hander with 27 health that says response, and this is tenacious, mill one. After an attack is played, it gets plus two or minus two speed. If you milled an attack this way, it gets plus three or minus three speed instead. Basically, you're giving everything plus two or minus two speed, and you're doing it at response timing, so there's very, very little that your rival can do about that. Now, you do have to mill one. That's not a huge cost, but it does mean that in control games, your rival can typically out control you because you'll be the first one to deck out, but it's not a huge cost. Next, we get this response, commit. After your rival plays an enhance ability on an attack, if that attack has less than its printed speed, cancel its effects. So if your rival does not want their attacks enhanced to be canceled under all circumstances, they will have to increase the speed. Otherwise, you are already giving it minus two or minus three speed, and then you can cancel its effects. Both of these responses are very, very powerful control responses, lending Jin to a more control-based game plan. And that brings us to his first primary weakness, is he is a control character with a six hand size instead of seven. Most of the time when we see a control character really take off in competitive play, they're a seven-hander. I'm thinking of like Eraserhead 1, uh, Momo 1 was a six-hander, but got to basically see a seventh card once per turn by grabbing it out of her discard. And Shoto Todoroki 1, uh, Shigaraki 3, all of these control characters are typically seven-handers. They see more cards. They want to take control of the game and always be blocking everything or stopping their rival from attacking. But Jin is a six-hander. So we first want a lot of card draw, both on offense and on defense, to compensate for that. The second thing where he struggles is on damage. He can struggle to find the backswing. So he can survive for a long time thanks to his defense. And he's adding speed onto his attacks, which lends himself to this poke game plan where he's going to have this momentum, but he's not throwing stats on everything like Wolfwood or like Younger Toguro. Uh, he's throwing a lot of printed damage moves. So those are the two primary weaknesses of this character. He needs cards in hand and two, he needs damage to be able to find a backswing. When this, first, when this character first got revealed, I immediately thought he was the best character in the game. I said as much on Facebook. I went to the Facebook Universes group and said, uh, change my mind, Jin is the best character in the game. That was the exact same day that he was revealed. He's just so obviously a cracked character, but he does have those weaknesses. And when I actually started playing him on the launch of Yu Yu Hakusho, his other weakness I found out was basically his symbols, air, life, and void. The void symbol felt decent. It felt like I was seeing enough cards, but it didn't feel like it quite had the spam foundations uh, to have a solid competitive deck, and then it didn't find it didn't feel like I was finding the damage on the backswing. Air felt like I was getting both the damage and the card draw, but I was being forced to play this like uh, falling skies, walk the dog type attack lineup, and the card draw was fine, but it was on a lot of flip cards. And Jen wants repeatable card draw more so than flip card draw. I wasn't really feeling it on air. Air is just kind of a weak symbol right now. And then on life, I can never quite make it to where I wanted. The card draw really seemed lacking on life. You were basically playing Twisty, Tasty Riff or uh, Rejuve Smash, and there wasn't a lot beyond that for card draw. So I was never feeling... I tested him on all three builds, and I never really was feeling super confident about his competitive levelness. I figured that life was probably his best symbol for Command Pigeon Flock to build in Masho Concealment, but never quite got it to work. Obviously, Corey Aguilar did a great job and made top cuts uh, on the life symbol at the Wish Tournament. But that was about the extent of my gen testing. I kind of moved on because I'd been playing Hawks quite a bit. I played Hawks for the HLC, and one of the main downsides of Hawks was I would survive for forever and play great defense, but I would never have the backswing to kill someone. It would happen quite frequently. It even happened in the HLC. If you watch my recap video, I was playing against Edshot. We had both built to like super into deadlock. They had committed out on this crazy attack string. I had somehow lived said attack string. 
They had only like one ready foundation. This was it. It's time for me to go and win the game. I draw my hand and I just I just had nothing in terms of damage. I had some feathers and like another attack and maybe something else, but I couldn't deal more than 15 damage no matter what. So basically I just had to build and pass and then say, okay, I'm playing defense again. And that's kind of how Void Jin was feeling for me before the Critical Role decks and before Knot's Flask entered the scene. Was very, very defensive, but hard to win on the backswing. So how does Knot's Flask solve everything for Void Jin? Well, Knot's Flask is this one diff asset that says after you build it, you add three booze counters. And then every turn you can mill three. If you don't mill an attack this way, add one booze counter to this card. So if you're playing a more controlled deck that's not having a lot of it's not having a super high attack ratio, you're pretty frequently getting more booze counters on this card. And this gin list, by the way, is, is only running 30% attacks. We're not at like 33, 35, 40 percent. We're only at 30 percent. So typically a knots flask over the course of a game is getting four or five counters on average, although it is milling you out uh, faster because you're milling three every turn and, and gin is milling. So sometimes this is always at least three counters. Sometimes it's four or five. Then we can commit and remove a booze counter. This attack gets plus three or minus three damage. This is on a one diff asset. If we ever get to zero boost counters, this at your attacks get minus two speed. So we're basically never going to let ourselves get to zero boost counters unless it's our final attack and we need it to get lethal. Our opponent's tapped out and we don't care about minus two speed, right? If they have like three cards in their card pool, no ready foundations, I need two more damage to get to lethal. I don't care that I'm getting minus two speed. I'm going to get it and I'm going to commit knots flask. What this allows us to do is play really, really versatile defense. And on the backswing, if we have two or three of these, that's another six, another nine damage. That is all that is needed to make Jin very, very scary on the backswing. Basically, until you're ready for your lethal turn, you are almost never using Knot's Flask for offense. You're using it on defense. This means that Jin already is blocking almost everything. But now if he's choosing not to block, He's going to subtract that damage out, just making his defense even more potent. If you build a Knot's Flask, you're basically saying Jin is no longer 27 health, he's 33 health. If you build two, then you're now saying, hey, I'm a 39 health character. Hey, I'm a 45 health character. Pretty soon, it's just crazy. People have to deal so much damage uh, to get through Jin once you have some Knot's Flasks in your stage. Also, it's going to make the crackback on the backswing uh, much, much more potent and much more lethal if you have access to another three, six, nine damage on the backswing. That is what Knot's Flasks unlocks in Jin. is Jin now has the ability to deal with these HP sponge characters. We just got Fresh Cut Grass, who's like going to be like a 50, 75 health character when all is said and done after he uses all his wound restores and other shenanigans. Knot's Flask is going to help us push through those HP sponge characters, going to help us push through those Youngers and Yakos that have 30 plus health. Um, yeah, this is everything that Jin needed. Let's jump into everything else. I'm going to normally, when I do a deck profile, I show you my attacks, then I show you my actions, assets, and then finally, we just go through all the foundations. I'm going to do things differently here. First, I want to talk about each of Jin's problems and how the deck overcomes those problems. The problems were card draw. We need lots of card draw because we're a control, you know, we're playing this control game plan and the more cards in hand, the more ability we are able to take control of the game and then the ability to get damage for the backswing. Since I already started with damage with Knot's Flask and how that overcomes what Void was really lacking before the critical roll decks, let's just keep going there because I have a lot of cards in the deck dedicated to just getting damage for Jin. Number one, we have four copies of Paying the Cost. This foundation is crazy. When you are looking for a spam foundation to give you stats, you want those to be one, free, two, repeatable. And Paying the Cost is exactly that. Losing a health is basically free. We have a lot of cards in this deck that are also gaining us health. So it's not a big deal. I end more games closer to full health than I do closer to zero. Losing health is not a big cost. Your attack gets a damage. So if I have two of these on stage, 
I'm saying all of my attacks on the backswing are getting plus one damage. Everything's getting plus two damage with two of these on stage. This is a crazy card. I'm not using it a lot until I'm really going in for lethal. But like I said, the deck is gaining a lot of health. So even early in the game might use it if I know that attack is going to land. It is a three mid block. It is a four check. We don't care. Free repeatable plus one damage. We're taking it. We need all the damage we can get as Jin. Next up, I've got two copies of Red Riot's The Coolest. This is playable while committed. We can flip it for plus two damage. That is literally all it's doing. This deadlock enhances blank. We are not playing cards with red or hardened in their title in this deck. We are just flipping plus two damage. It's playable while committed. A lot of times this is all that we need to find lethal that turn instead of having to build and pass. Next up, I am playing four copies of Masho Concealment. Yes, that is correct. Four copies of Masho Concealment. This is a unique foundation. It feels a little crazy to play a unique foundation at a 4x. I don't care. This card is so good. You need it on stage every single game. This is like Mirio with Lemillion of the Big Three. I don't care that Lemillion of the Big Three is a unique. It changes games when it's on the stage. And when this is in your stage, it's going to fundamentally flip the game on its head. You can commit to cancel anything on a an enhance ability on a foundation, either on offense or defense. So you're leaning more into this gen cancel game plan. And then you get this team Masho enhance. This attack gets minus one speed or plus one damage. One of these in stage says all of your attacks for the rest of the game are getting plus one damage each. Do you see where we're going with this? We say, hey, plus one damage. If we have one of these in stage, all of our attacks are getting plus one damage. We can flip this for plus two damage. We can use the Knots Flask for plus three damage. Pretty soon, all of our attacks are getting like three or four damage. And we can push through a massive amount of uh, damage on the backswing. Next up, we got two copies of Prone to Dry Eyes. We're drawing a lot of cards in this deck from our attack lineup. I'll show you that here in just a little bit. But what Prone to Dry Eyes is going to allow us to do is discard those cards and get damage for each of them. It's also Stun Hate, but we're really not playing it for the Stun Hate. That's just nice to have. But we can say, hey, all of our attacks are getting plus one damage. All of our attacks are getting plus two damage. Pretty soon with these, with all of these out, we can get to the point to where we're playing attack strings and everything is getting five damage. And then when we, when we really need it to, we're committing flask and we're saying, hey, plus eight damage. And um, yeah, we are, rival's not going to be able to deal with that. We're already adding speed to everything, making it difficult for them to block. Next up, we have attacks. The core... Um, game plan for the attacks is to play through Echoes. So I've got three copies of Double Tornado Fest, Jen's UR. It's a four high five. If its attack speed is six or greater, it's getting two damage. It will always be six or greater if you play this as your first enhance. You know, if your opponent is a speed hate character, always use this as your first enhance before they take down the speed. Now they can't take down the speed below, zero, below four. Doesn't matter, barrier shield, nothing does it because we have this static, this attack speed cannot be reduced below its printed speed, making this a lot of times one of your best finishers. But it's going to be seven damage on face with a few of these things on stage. This is going to be like 10 damage. This is going to be like a six high 10, echo six high 10. You've only got one card in your card pool and your rival has had to play some crazy defense to survive already. Next up, we have a totally free echo printed in Yu Yu Hakusho, double fists of the mortal flame. This is going to have a first enhance, lose two health, at the top card of your deck to your momentum. This attack loses echo. If you already have a momentum, then you can echo this, and then you can um, play this enhance and get your momentum back, basically making this a free echo. If you play this and you didn't have momentum and you grab momentum, sometimes we can use cards like Hacker Extraordinaire, which is in the deck. I'll show you that in a little bit to just immediately draw a card with that momentum. And now it was like a three high four, lose two health to draw, which isn't great. This is probably our worst attack early in the game, but it's our best attack later in the game because this is going to be like seven, eight damage, echo it, seven, eight damage. So if we played double tornado fist, echoed it, double fist, echoed it, we've now played four moves. They're all dealing like seven or eight damage. They're all super, super fast and we don't have many cards in our card pool. And even though we're playing this low attack count, if we even find two of these, it's like we found four attacks. 
So they overcome the problem of only playing 30% attacks in the deck. That is it for the damage output part of this deck. Next up, I'm going to talk about the draw of this deck, the draw power. Because in this format, we need draw power on both offense and on defense. Jin wants to take control of the game. We want to see a lot of cards. So on offense, the draw power is coming from my attack lineup. First of all, we all know it. It's maybe the best, you know, top 10 attack in the game. Mop Strike, everybody has to deal with it. Youngers love it. it says discard a card, your rival discards a random card. Both players draw. If your rival's discarded, draw. So basically, a discard one, draw two. And it has Desperation three randomly, although I always forget to play the Desperation three. But four high four, one mid block that discards one, draws two. Just a great utility card. We love to see it. Next up, we have Rejuvenating Smash. Played as your second card this turn. You get to gain two health and draw two cards. And if you've discarded a card, you get a free momentum. And it has EX3 for a momentum outlet. Now, we have a lot of ways in this deck to discard cards. We have uh, Petty Squabble. I've already shown you Prone to Dry Eyes. I'm going to show you Botons Coaching here in just a little bit. There's lots of ways to discard and make sure that you get that free momentum. But the main reason you're playing it, just to draw those two cards. A lot of times I find myself playing Foundation, Rejuve, Draw 2, Gain 2, and then just build out from there. This was just my poke attack. Next up, we have three copies of Shards of Winter. I don't see a lot of people playing this attack. I think it's turbo busted. This is a crazy, crazy strong attack. It is stun one. This attack gets plus X speed. X equals the number of committed rival foundations. Well, Jin is adding speed to everything. And our rival is going to have to commit out to block those things. Pretty soon, you play Shards of Winter as your third or fourth attack. You're saying plus 10 speed, uh, plus 7 speed, plus 8 speed. They can't block it. What better move to dump damage on than Shards of Winter? Hey, let's pour some flasks into Shards of Winter, a lot of times it's just the best candidate for that. And it says, if this attack deals damage, draw one card. Well, it will deal damage because it's an eight speed attack. So those are our primary attacks that are drawing us cards. That is 11 of those. But on defense, I have, I think, 20, 16 foundations that draw cards. Let's count this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 18 cards, 18 cards that draw on defense. This is where the real powerhouse of the void symbol is for Jin. Younger, you know, we have mop strikes out here. Number one, Jin is really positioned well in the meta because he can cancel Younger's mop strike, forcing Younger to discard a card and he doesn't get to draw anything. You just say no to mop strike. Turning off mop strike is one of the best things you can do against Younger. It's why I think Jin has a super solid Younger matchup. But um, where was I going with that? The mop strikes. I can't remember even where I was going with that. Sorry, guys. But I've got 18 cards here that draw on defense. Oh, because Younger's, you know, the people are ripping up your hand. You have like or strike saying deadlock, discard three. We have all these cards like Botan's coaching forcing you to discard cards of your hand. It's very important to have draw on defense. So you're not just stuck with whatever you redraw off of Botan's coaching or mop strike or you're not just stuck with zero cards in hand from an aura strike deadlock bakugo four all of these people trying to get you to discard cards well if you go to zero cards in hand with botons coaching this says it's a zero diff says flip both players discard one card and draw one card if you have zero cards in hand you just do as much as you can to this ability you're just drawing so on defense hey zero cards in hand flip a botons coaching i'll draw that is flip to draw on a zero diff is kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. Next up, we have idle work. Not a huge fan of this card, but we did need a little bit more of self foundation destruction. And it says if it deals no damage, draw one card and discard one card. This can help us on offense really hunt for more attacks or on defense. It can help us hunt for block zones. We're playing the Falling Skies deck. We don't care about low blocks or mid blocks. We just need more high blocks. Idle work's going to help us find those high blocks. Speaking of Falling Skies decks, decks like Younger that just play a million high attacks, Adorable Telepath. 
We build it into our stage, and then we can add this card to our hand. This attack is plus one or minus one speed. So we're playing against a younger. We don't have any high blocks in hand. We just say, hey, minus one speed, block with the adorable telepath. The nice thing about adorable telepath is it really works well with Knott's Flask because it also says response after you play this card, your next attack is plus one or minus one damage. So you say block with adorable telepath, minus one damage to the next one, and then you're going to use Knott's Flask on that next attack. It already has minus one damage. We know we're going to damage reduce it. We're going to commit Knott's Flask, take down three more. It just pairs really, really nicely into that damage reduction game plan, but it's mainly there because in this format, you need high blocks. High blocks are way more important than low blocks in the current meta. Next up, we got Unexpected Hero. After your rival discards a card, you can commit this to draw. So if we're using Mop Strike or Botan's Coaching, we can commit Unexpected Hero, grab another card as well. If our rival is using Botan's Coaching or Mop Strike, whenever they discard a card, we can use Unexpected Hero. This commit to draw is online so much really, really worth it. Also, this flip for minus three speed and plus three damage. Sometimes you're using this on defense just to give something minus more speed to help you block it. Sometimes you're using this on offense where you don't care if your attack is minus three speed. They're committed out. You just need three more damage. Really nice utility card here. But the MVP of defensive draw by a million is Hacker Extraordinaire. Guys, you need, if you are on these symbols, you need to run this card for Vegas. You need to run this card. Number one, assets. The strength of assets are at an all-time high. Almost every single competitive deck is playing some form of assets. Hacker Extraordinaire says discard a momentum, flip that asset. That's huge on its own. If you flip a cape of no return, you are winning. Number two, Hacker Extraordinaire says discard a momentum, grab, you know, draw a card, and it's playable while committed. So Jen is adding all this speed. We're playing this great poke game plan. What better way to cash in than Hacker Extraordinaire to use that momentum to go and draw a card on defense? We can use this on offense as well, but most of the time I'm using it on defense. I'm immediately cashing in on the momentum from my offensive turn so that I can draw, I can find the block zones that I need. You must, must, must be playing Hacker Extraordinaire. Next up, I got three copies of Petty Squabble. Now, this foundation serves a huge purpose in just the response alone, which says discard a card after your rival plays an ability on a foundation, commit a rival copy of that card. You know, let's say you're playing another gen, you're in the mirror match. They use Masho Concealment, you discard a card with Petty Squabble, you say, hey, let's, uh, let's commit that Masho Concealment. You know, goodbye. Um, you don't get to use that anymore. You, you have multiple weapon clashes. Well, yeah, I'll or use weapon clash once, I'll discard a card, commit that weapon clash down. This is huge right now, and it's going to help us get to zero cards in hand, which matters for this bottom enhance. Commit your character. Both players discard two and draw two. Okay, if we had one card in hand, we discard it with Petty Squabble, commit something on a rival stage, and let's say we still have Jin ready, but we don't really care too much about canceling a rival enhance on an attack, then we can just say, hey, commit Jin, I'll draw two cards. Again, if you have no cards in hand, you just do as much as you can, you just draw the cards. Basically, with the Petty Squabble on stage, it says Jen doesn't only say commit to cancel. It says Jen can commit to cancel or Jen can commit to draw two or discard two and draw two. I've used this card on offense quite a bit when I get the sense that my rival's got a Genkai's Guidance in hand or they've sculpted the perfect blocks. And I say, yeah, commit Jen on offense because I'm going in for lethal. And... I'm going to get those that barrier shield, that Genkai's Guidance, that referee, jury, get it out of your hand. You're drawing a new two random cards. Very, very powerful foundation. I started running this at a 2x, immediately realized I needed it at a 3x. And then our last item to draw on defense is two copies of Ultra Regeneration. It is a six check, two low block, four diff. But we don't care too much about the four diff because Jen is a lot of times spending his early turns building. So, you know, you can always go Ultra Regen on a 4, Rejuvenating Smash on a 6. Draw 2, gain 2. A lot of times, if I draw those two cards, that is the line I'm taking. I'm going to go ahead and build Ultra Regen, then I'm going to play Rejuve. We also have other ways in this deck to make that 4 a little cheaper. We're not running Titan Cliff, but I'll show you what I mean um, in just a little bit. But Ultra Re Regeneration says, if I take more than 5 damage, I'm going to flip, I'm going to draw 2 and gain 2. I'm going to draw 2, gain 2, 
Now I've got more cards in hand. These 18 cards, oh, also it says that if I'm completely committed out, I can remove it and go grab something from my discard pile to my hand. I have a, a favorite thing to go grab and it's Genkai's Guidance. Oh no, I'm tapped out. I can't block anything. All right, I'll go grab Genkai's Guidance. All right, let's get that out of there. Feels <laughs> really, really good. Uh, this is 18 cards that draw on defense. A lot of times what this enables me to do as Void Jin is I'm going to build out my entire hand. There are so many times I say pass to my rival. I've got zero cards in hand and I'm not even worried about it because I know I'm going to draw five cards on defense. I'm going to petty squabble. I'm going to draw two. Block, block. I'm going to flip ultra regen, draw two. I'm going to discard some momentum to draw. I'm going to grab this back to my hand for a high block. I can flip this to draw one. There's so many ways to draw. It enables me to just build out my hand. I don't have to worry about keeping cards in hand. It'll be okay. I've got so much card draw on defense. I'll find the blocks that I need. So that was the draw on offense. And then we had the draw on defense. Let's go into just utility cards at this point. This is the rest of the deck. They're all serving some sort of function, but they're not just neatly falling into either you draw or we're finding the damage for the backswing, the two weaknesses of Jin himself. Let's go into each of these. First of all, easily excited. Again, low blocks are super, super important in this meta right now. This is a two, low a two high block, it's a zero diff, and it's gonna give something plus one speed in a turn. This is gonna enable us to really play this poke game plan really well. Hey, I'm gonna give it plus two or three speed with Jin. I'll give it another plus speed with Easily Excited. Then we have Practical Studies, which also gives plus one speed to a poke. And anytime our rival is blocking our first attack or they don't lose health, I'm gonna give plus speed to future things. But the biggest reason this is in the deck is because I need more deadlock threats as Jin. And this says commit seal one rival asset or foundation. Your attack gets plus three speed. So if they're in deadlock and I have like two of these and one of these in my stage, I'll play my first attack. I'll say plus two speed, plus three speed, plus four speed, plus five speed. Commit, seal that, plus three more speed. Now I got plus eight speed on my attack. That is how you break down an opponent wall. Now they're either taking that damage or they are committing out to block this 10 speed move. They're going to have to use all of their speed hate for this move. Uh, practical studies and easily excited, really helping that uh, poke game plan. We want that momentum. We want to draw with hacker extraordinaire. These things are going to enable us to do it. And it's just deadlock threat. And all seven of these are high blocks. Next up, I've got two copies of endless loathing. This is a card I've really fallen in love with. It really helps us play ultra regen, which is a four difficulty foundation. But this says form flip, the next foundation you try to play ignores progressive difficulty. So if we go attack, rejuve, build a foundation, build a foundation, build a foundation, hey, now I'll flip ultra, I'll end, flip endless loathing, I'll build ultra regen on a four. I got to free build ultra regen at the end of, with six cards in card pool at a time where I should not be trying to build ultra regen. Feels really nice for that. It's also a two high block when high blocks are important. It's also a deadlock form flip. Your rival's next check gets minus two. Your next check gets plus two. That's nice because we're not doing a lot of ignoring progressive beyond playing echoes. Next up, two copies of Can't Escape Me. This is one of the absolute best cards in the meta right now. We can cancel Mop Strike with this. We can cancel Maximum Overhaul with this. We can cancel things as silly as, um, what's that two diff foundation that's on life? It says, choose opponent rival foundation. They add it to their hand. Then you add one to your hand and then you both build one down. You can cancel that. There's all sorts of things you can cancel because it doesn't cancel draws. It cancels anything that your rival does that adds cards to their hand, making this a really, really good utility piece. It's also, again, one of our best deadlocks here. Commit your attack at speed for each committed rival foundation. So between the deadlock on Can't Escape Me, deadlock on Endless Loathing, deadlock on Practical Studies, now we've got enough deadlock to where we can really push through walls at the end of games. There is Can't Escape Me. I would probably be running three or four of this if I wasn't already Jin, right? I can already cancel a Mop Strike. This is just gravy on top. Nice to have. you got to run it. Two copies of Spooky. I'm not running a lot of resets in Jin right now. Basically, the biggest thing that goes into dunks is momentum. And if we can keep our rival off momentum by like blocking most things, 
then they're probably not going to be able to make these big armor of the wolf type dunks on us. But in case that, you know, this is our best reset here. Switch the speed and damage. We can use Jin, use Masho Concealment for minus speed. That's minus three or four speed. And then just swap it with Spooky. And then if they still have like two or three damage, we can then use Knot's Flask to take the damage even further down. This is the reset in the deck. That's why I've got two copies of it. It is pretty important. Next up, Citywide Crisis. This is almost all the time for me used on offense, not on defense. Typically, you see this played for the bottom enhance, remove, reduce this attack speed to its printed speed, playable while committed. And then you get this other response. After your rival adds cards to their hand, they put one to their card pool face down. I use that top response a lot against like struggling with studies. For example, they have zero cards in hand. They flip struggling studies. They try and get that card back in their hand. Maybe they're trying to get like a Genkai's Guidance back in their hand. And then you say, uh, commit. No, 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 no. You're going to put that back in your card pool. Um, but the enhance, I use most of the time on offense because you got it committed. You, you're playing like a um, Rejuve Smash. They play down Barrier Shield. They say take the attack speed to zero. Well, I'm not clearing my card pool a lot. Breaker 2 can sometimes be pretty devastating. So I remove this and I say, no, let's take it back to printed. Let's take it back to four speed at least. So that's why one cost, it's, I don't know. It's not super key to the deck. I can see myself taking it out, but running it at one copy doesn't feel bad. Then we got one copy of Unbreakable. This is because we're drawing on defense so much that we really can't guarantee our block zones. Well, if we commit unbreakable, destroy a foundation, now that mid block can block, can full block a high attack or a low attack, kind of helps us compensate for that. I was running this at a two of, and then I was feeling so good about how I was drawing um, on defense that uh, I took it back down to a one of, but I do think you need one copy of this in your deck. You can always sideboard more in if needed. Also, this response, discarding momentum to protect your stage is not nothing, it's online more than you would expect. You just have to remember to use it. It's also a two high block. It's also another way we can destroy our stage. We had two idle works and now we got one unbreakable. Now we have ways to destroy our stage. Oh my gosh. Okay, next up, I got two copies of Dimensional Sphere. This is our throw hate in the deck. You know, before the this attacks uh, blocks damage step, you remove it. And so um, I had one opponent I was playing against Overhaul the other day. They were playing Jaw Jammer and they were just stacking all their damage on Jaw Jammer. And then they used Wound Restore. And they said, if this deals damage, you're going to lose another four health. It looked like that was going to be game for me. Then I flipped Botan's Coaching. I drew Dimensional Sphere and I said, Block, yeah, let's get that throw out of there. You know, Wound Restore, not happening anymore. Uh, saved me like 10 health. Just an absolute godsend sometimes. Praying, playing it primarily for the defense, but also on offense, it goes back to that draw. If it's not blocked, draw two and discard one. It also has stun one, basically making this a pseudo six speed move. And if they block it, uh, then they just committed out resources to block a one damage move. If they don't block it, we get to draw two and uh, discard one. So that feels nice. Two copies of this, I could see siding in a third if needed. Next up, Three copies of Ice Sword Execution. This attack sets up lethal so, so much. Just saying, hey, commit all of those down. Oh no, you have three Keiko's Aids. This is going to be terrible. Well, commit all those Keiko's Aids for me. And now I don't have to worry about those. Also, it's going to set up things like Shards of Winter. Hey, commit three of that card. That's giving this thing three speed, whether or not they block. And it's a high damage uh, starter because we can discard a momentum to make this 10 damage in gen we're also adding speed so this is going to be like a seven or eight or nine speed because we have all these things like um, practical studies and easily excited adding speed to our openers a lot of times this is just a 10 high 14 10 high 12 you know you're going to have to deal with this i'm also stunning two stunning three i'm taking down your best defensive piece Late in the game, we love, love, love to see this. It's also a too high block. Next up, one copy of Cape of No Return. If you're on these symbols, you play one copy of Cape of No Return. That's just the rules. Remove an attack from the game. If you have like a few knots flasks and a Cape of No Return and Jin out, you feel so safe. It's just like 
There is no way they're dealing damage to me right now. Um, and last up, our favorite, two copies of Genkai's Guidance. We can slam it down and destroy three foundations, remove an opponent's attack from the game. Remember, we can grab this with Ultra Regen if we're committed out. So this is like the uh, panic button, right? Like, oh my gosh, they actually pushed through Jin's defenses. I'm going to die. Panic. Go grab Genkai's Guidance. Now we got, you know, a little extra life here. Also, this first form, we're almost never using it. Honestly, early in the game, it's really nice that we have cards like Botan's Coaching, Petty Squabble, Mop Strike. We have all these cards that allow us to discard things from our hand. So early in the game, uh, so often I am discarding Genkai's Guidance. I need two of it because I really need to see... When you need to see it, you really, really need to see it. But because we have all this self-discard outlets, Genkai's Guidance is always your choice. You know, you'd rather build and uh, destroy three foundations is not something you want to do early in the game. So that is the main board. It is 75 cards, I believe. Um, 23 attacks on 75 cards. It's been feeling really nice for me. I just won my local qualifier this past weekend with it. I, uh, yeah, I went undefeated. I think I only dropped one game out of five rounds. I think I went 10 and one. <laughs> it, it, it felt really good. It felt awesome. So this is probably the deck that I'll be playing in Vegas. You guys know I always just tell everybody what I'm playing and show my deck lists. It, you know, people panic thinking that if you put out your secret sauce to the world that then it won't be as good in the event or something. I told everybody my Mirio deck list before Nationals still did well. I told everybody my Hawks deck before um, Worlds. I told everybody my Mirio deck before uh, Webcam Regional. It typically really doesn't matter. Um, I'd rather just be open and show you guys my deck lists. And most of the time it helps me because then I get people who give me feedback. So my sideboard is kind of a theoretical sideboard at the moment. It's basically a, a complete transition into Hie. Hie plays really nicely with this attack lineup because most of our attacks have pretty solid base speed. Other than this one, you would never use this one. Uh, but like Rejuve is four speed. Mob Strike is four speed. Dimensional Spheres is five speed, uh, four speed, three speed. Like it works pretty well with Hie. And then if they're doing all of these like blocks from stage or if they're hurting for cards in hand, then Hie feels really, really good to side into. Like um, in the finals at my local qualifier, I sided into Hie for game two because my opponent was playing Overhaul and they were playing things like Showdown and Barrier Shield and Hie just kind of laughs at those cards. He says, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and commit and get that out. Let's get that Showdown out of there. Um, Overhaul is struggling for cards in hand. They finally use their thing to block from stage and then you just say, yeah, nope, get it, get it out. Uh, feels really nice there. Also, you're very similar to Jin in that you're giving speed to your attacks. You're minusing speed from your rival's attacks. So basically, when I was switching into Hie, I would put in one more attack and bring the attack ratio just a little higher. I put in Can't Escape Me. I put in two copies of Barrier Shield, one copy of Decoy Duplicate, two Daunting Messages since we can control our health and get us to less than half health. This feels really nice. And then two copies of Learning the Standards. So Hie is a little less defensive than Jin, but we're bringing in a lot of defense when we're siding into him. The cards that we're siding out to go into Hie won't really surprise you. We are siding out the three Petty Squabbles. We are siding out the four Masho Concealments because we're no longer Team Masho. That is seven, eight cards. And then we're siding out two copies of Knot's Flask because we're bringing in the two copies of Barrier Shield. I don't want my actions and assets getting too high. So, man, I really meant this to be only like a 15 minute video. I think I've talked for way, way longer than that. Hope you enjoyed this deck profile. I'm not sure if I would ever really cite into Hie all that much. It's kind of just theoretical at this point. I've played several rounds with Hie as the face of the deck and it feels really, really good actually. I might've been sleeping on Hie some. Um, I liked him when he first got released and then after a few weeks, I kind of soured on him. I didn't even put him in my top 50. Well, I'm starting to change my mind. 
Uh, not only did he make top, or he almost made top cuts at the webcam regional. I think uh, somebody was just one game uh, short of making top cuts, but it's just been doing really well for me. But that is Jen. This is the deck that I'm leaning to for Vegas. He feels really, really well positioned in the meta. Uh, Knott's Flask just takes him from... Knott's Flask was the thing that took him from feeling very good in testing to feeling broken in testing. Like... This deck and character feels utterly broken when playing him. And Knott's Flask was what really elevated him. Because when you're going to an event like Las Vegas, uh, these major regionals where everybody's bringing their best of the best, you don't want to be playing something that is just good. You know, it might have dominated your local scene, but in the end, it's just good or very good. You want to bring something that is completely broken. And that's how this deck has been feeling. So this is where I'm leaning. I'm actually playing, I'm playing in a local qualifier tonight. And I'm playing Chaos Amajiki. It's kind of a fun spin on my Mirio list. I really wanted to play around the world and walk the dog. I'll probably do a deck profile of that here in just a little bit. But if Vegas was today, I would be playing Void Jin. Feel free to copy my list, take my list, make changes, make it your own. I suspect we're going to see a lot of Jin in Las Vegas. So if nothing else, this deck profile will help you prepare for me. Um, and that was probably a little dumb of me, but who cares? And that is going to do it for me. I'll see you guys next time.